Hey, thanks for tuning in to Kingdom Minded. I'm Shane Blackledge. Please, if you have not subscribed to this channel, I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers in the next 90 days, and I need you to help me get there. Thank you very much. Uh, today is actually my birthday, and so I'm super excited to be alive. 43 years old, it's crazy. I didn't think I was gonna live to be 21 years of age when I was living a life of sin and recklessness and lawlessness and was out selling drugs and gang banging and just not doing what I thought I was gonna be doing when I was a little boy, uh, wanting to sign up and join uh, the Marines and serve our country. And I never got that chance because uh, before I was 18, uh, as a juvenile, I was arrested and sent to prison. Uh, so, crazy though what my plans are versus what God's plans are and here I am and here you are and for some reason God has connected the dots between you and I and you're listening to me and so here's what I have for you today I want to talk to you about divine encounters okay because throughout your life there are moments in time where God reveals himself to you. And sometimes it's through a song. Sometimes it's something on the radio. Other times it's a person, a stranger, somebody coming at the right moment at the right time. And it's not coincidence. It's not chance. It's not luck. It's a God encounter. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And I'm going to share a passage of scripture with you that will kind of highlight um, these divine revelations that we get that are life-changing and transforming. And as I look back over my life and the 43 years that I've lived, there are definitely, definitely moments in time that were divine appointments with God that only he could have orchestrated the setup this way. So do you remember like coloring, coloring books, and they had the connect the dots. And if you follow the numerical uh, value, you can connect the dots. And ultimately, you're just seeing a bunch of dots and numbers. But then once you start connecting the dots, it, it ends up being a shape. And what ends up happening is you just drew an elephant or you just drew a, a, a picture but you really didn't see that picture until you connected those dots. And really throughout our lifetime, God is connecting these dots for you that are laid out, but you don't see that big picture. And today the big picture is salvation, right? It's eternal life. It's that living water that only Jesus can provide, right? No one can get through the father except through him. See, I believe in the truth and the truth will set you free. But to get to the truth, you have to understand and know who Jesus is. And then once you know who he is, encounter him and have a personal relationship with him because you've encountered him and you've experienced him and you've got to know him. See, many people know who Jesus is. They just don't know Jesus personally. And that's one of the things that sets us apart and that makes us different than other people. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have a personal relationship with God where we can personally pray to God. And here's the deal. God does listen to your prayers. He does. He sees and knows everything that we're doing. He knows what we're doing behind closed doors. He knows every thought that comes in our mind. He knows every action that we do. And today, I want to talk to you about divine encounters because there's a passage of scripture that really speaks to this divine revelation. Because divine appointments happen to you, they happen to me, and they will happen to everyone. There will be times that God actually chases you down. God's pursuing you. You don't have to go and look for God. He's already there. He's already here with us. So God will connect the dots so you can see that big picture. That big picture really is ultimately to have that relationship with him, that everlasting 
relationship and love that we get by pursuing Christ. So John 4, one, chapter 1 through, excuse me, chapter 4, verses 1 through 44, um, talk about the Samaritan, the Samaritan woman. And just kind of give you a little backstory to this whole thing is, you know, Jesus is in Jerusalem and he's going to go to Galilee. So they took the route through Samaria to take a shorter route. And I believe that it was on his intention to go a different route. You know, he went there with intention on encountering people. He went there with an intention to miraculously change people's lives. And so here we are, Jesus and his disciples are traveling along the way and they go through Samaria and it's about noon. He says the sixth hour, the disciples go off to go get some food in the town and Jesus sits down at the well. He's tired. It's hot. It's the hottest time of the day. And a Samaritan woman comes to the well to draw water. And what's significant about this is she's coming at noon. Most would go in the morning or at night, but she goes in the heat of the day. She's trying to avoid any encounters. She doesn't want to meet anybody, right? But here's Jesus sitting down, tired, thirsty, at the well. And she is a Samaritan, and Jesus is a Jew. And a little bit more behind that is, I would say, the Assyrians... And the Jews did not like each other. And it goes all the way back from the time of like 721 BC, when the Northern Kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians. And then what happened was the Jews and the Assyrians uh, uh, started having children together and generations upon generations, uh, there was a simulation. And then you can see later on, the Samaritans are opposing Nehemiah building uh, the temple after the temple was destroyed. And so then really where the hatred started happening between the Samaritans and the Jews um, happened because of the Jews were wanting to rebuild the temple. And they're saying, no, we don't want you to rebuild the temple. And also they had kind of created their own religion. They had their own version of the first five books of the gospel. So they truly believed in their eyes that they were the true descendants of Moses, that they had the truth and nobody else was right. They had built their own temple on Mount Gerizim. And so they rejected the rest of the Bible. They rejected the rest of the Old Testament, the prophets and the writings. And they just believed in their own version of the five books from Moses and that they believed they were the true Israelites. And so that's why there was this great beef and hatred for the Jews and the Samaritans. It was much deeper than what we can just imagine by picking out uh, the story in John and reading it. So anyways, she goes to this well. She is fully aware that Jews don't like Samaritans. And she goes there to be unseen, to grab some water. And during this encounter you know, Jesus asked her for some water. And what's interesting about this is that he actually broke tradition and broke custom by asking her for water. So during this encounter, he broke three Jewish customs. The first one, he spoke to her despite the fact that she was a woman. That wasn't custom. Two, she was a a Samaritan woman, and the Jews traditionally despise the Samaritans. So that's the second custom or tradition. And then the third thing, the third thing is he asked to use her cup or jar to drink water, which also made him ceremonially unclean. So it's very interesting to see how Jesus um, asked her for water right? Because this is not normal. He's doing something unorthodox. He's doing something, what we would call today, bizarre, just shocking, right? Today's headlines, we like breaking news. Look what Jesus did, because it's not normal for him to do this. And so I'm going to give you 
uh, four takeaways, right? Four takeaways to the story, but let's just go right into the story right now. Uh, bear with me. If you have a Bible, turn to John chapter four, and I'm going to be reading out of the ESV version, but let's go ahead and just dive right in. Let's read this passage, and then I'm going to pull four crucial things out of this. You can really pull so much more out of this. I'm just going to go over four basic things that I would like to give to you, because this is what God has given to me in this story that's so passionate and just shows and captures truly the love and the compassion that Jesus really has for us, for everyone, for the whole entire world. He did not just come to save the Jews. He came to save the world, okay? And so anyways, we're just going to dive right into this passage, and I'm just going to share my screen with you so we can go through this. And uh, we'll get right away, right into this. So um, hopefully you can bear with me and I'll get rolling here. So Jesus and the woman of Samaria. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, he left Judea and departed for Galilee. And as he passed through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. Some translations say that he was tired. He was. He had been tired from his journey. And this was about the sixth hour. So it's about 12 o'clock. A woman from Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. But Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Right away, Jesus is talking to her about living water. He's talking to her about eternal salvation. Verses 11, the woman said to him, sir, you have done nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And there he is referring to that eternal life, the salvation that we find through Christ. In the verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, hmm, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you are now have, you, it is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I have perceived that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. She's referring to her religion in the temple at the mountain that she worships at. In verses 21, Jesus says to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for the salvation is from the Jews. And he's telling her about who she's worshiping to. The verse 23, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Wow. He is ministering to this woman. He is sharing the gospel news with her that the truth to reaching the father and to worshiping the father is in spirit and is in truth. 
and it's by knowing who he is. And that's what I love about this verse coming up. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Here's what Jesus says. Verse 26, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples come back. What do you seek? They marvel that he was talking with the woman. They're like, whoa, what is he doing? But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people. So this is where she went back to Samaritan. She's in Samaritan, uh, Samaria right now. She went back to her town. And she says, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? She's basically evangelizing to these people and telling them to come and meet him. So they went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months? Then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, Lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. But here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor." Verse 29, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days and many more believed because of his word. How awesome is this story? Verses 42, they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. And after two days, he departed for Galilee for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. I will stop right there. Many Samaritans came to believe how amazing is this so here we have this story in john chapter 4 1 through 40 42 about this woman at the well what an encounter people that were hated by jews right there was many barriers that blocked them from getting along in a long history of hundreds of years all the way back to the 700 bc's of the Samaritans and Jews not getting along, not liking each other. And Jesus purposely goes to seek the lost because salvation belongs to everyone. It's neither Jew nor Gentile. Jesus just wants your soul. He wants your heart. He wants you. And that truly is the gospel. And that's why it's up to us to testify to what we know is the truth. And that's why it's up to us to spread the gospel like Jesus. Look at the woman. She was saved. And she turned around, went into town and said, hey, you need to come and see this person for yourself. That's what we need to do. We need to let people know that Jesus is real and that the truth can set you free. That's exactly what we're called to do as believers in Christ. So I want to just give you four quick takeaways that I got out of this that really just spoke to me is that number one, Jesus doesn't focus on sin. He focused on presenting that living water to her. You see, he knew that she had five husbands and that the person that she was living with right now was not her husband. She was a woman living in sin, lost, worshiping the wrong God on the wrong mountain, in the wrong temple. But Jesus didn't care about what she was doing wrong. Jesus didn't care about her sin, okay? What Jesus cared about was giving her life, living water. 
That's what Jesus cared about was her soul. Okay. He had a mission to transform her life. And she in turn transformed someone else's life. And that's what we have to do as believers is have this missional mindset to go out and preach the gospel to the lost so that Jesus can transform lives. He focused on eternal salvation. He didn't throw up sin in her face. Here's the deal. God knows exactly what you're doing. God knows what you're doing behind closed doors when nobody else is looking or knowing. He knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows every hair on your head. The second takeaway is Jesus breaks tradition. Jesus breaks tradition. It's not sin, but he broke tradition. He took a risk to reach the lost. We should be taking risks to reach the lost and not be so concerned about tradition. Oh, well, you're not doing ministry right, or you're not worshiping right, or you're not doing this right. Instead of critiquing what churches are doing, we need to be focused on taking risks to reaching the lost for Christ, because that truly is what it's about. It's not about your rules and your traditions and how you do this and how you do that. It's about transformation that we find through Jesus Christ. It's about the truth and knowing the truth that will set you free comes through Jesus. And that's the focus is giving out eternal life, letting people know, sharing with people your testimony, sharing with people the gospel truth and allow the Holy Spirit to change that person's heart to change that person's mind. Because ultimately all we need to do as followers in Christ is love people and point them to Jesus. And that's it. Allow God to do the rest. The third takeaway is that here's the deal. Jesus knows everything. He knows exactly what your secrets are. He knows what your past is. He knows all of your failures that you've ever done. And he knows every single sin that you've ever done he came to set us free from sin. He set this woman free from sin and he can set you free from sin. He can set your neighbor free from sin. He can set your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, your cousin, your aunt, your uncle, your grandma, your grandpa. He can set everyone free. That's the power of the gospel. The message of redemption and life giving Water is for everyone. And it's up to us to be the light into this dark world. It's up to us to share how God has transformed our lives and how he can transform yours. And the last piece that I want to mention is number four, that God took this sinner that was lost, that was had five husbands and turned her mess into a message and here she is having a testimony. She didn't go to Bible college. She didn't take any classes or any courses. She went to her town and told the other Samaritans about Jesus. And they came and believed and many lives were saved. Many lives were saved. And Jesus used a woman at the well. Wow, what a crazy, incredible, and powerful testimony. Here's the deal. Every person has value. Everybody can be used by God and should be used by God to help reach the lost. Thank you again for tuning in today. Do me a favor, please. Like and subscribe to this channel. I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers in the next 90 days. God bless you. Take care.